The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. All right. Welcome, everybody. Mike Hamilton here. We still have a bunch of people logging in. This has ended up being quite a, a popular session. We have several hundred people signed up. So I think we're going to call this the two-minute warning. That will give everybody a, still a chance to get logged in and settle down. So just enough time to go top up your beverage of choice. Maybe check that last email. We will officially start at two minutes after the hour. All right, for the 30 or so people who've logged in since my last announcement, people are still logging in furiously at a, a vast rate. So we're going to pause another minute or two, give everybody a chance to get logged in before we officially start. So again, just another minute or two of patience and we will get started. All right, everybody, my clock has officially turned over to two minutes after the hour. It looks like people are still logging in, but we cannot wait. We are just going to have to push forward. People are just going to have to catch up as they log in. So first off, welcome. It's another Madcap Software webinar, only for a change, rather than being the host, I have actually been asked to share some of my lesser known kind of power features in Flare. So this is gonna be kind of cool. I get to switch sides of the microphone this time. Now, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Mike Hamilton. My official title, I'm the Vice President of Product Evangelism here at Madcap Software. And I joke, that's kind of a way of saying, don't ever let your business partner give you a title when you're not here to discuss it. Um, I am one of the original founders here at Madcap Software, so I go way back to the beginning. And then as far as my background, I'm kind of a strange bird to be either in the software business or in the technical writing business. My education is actually in physics, of all things, but way back in the 1980s, yes, I'm that old, um, I found out that when you work at a nuclear power plant and you are the one that complains the loudest about how bad the reactor plant operations manuals are, they put you in charge of the technical publications library. And that sent me careening off in a whole new career direction. Initially, I was heavily involved in technical editing, then later technical writing, and because nuclear power was just oh so popular, and I got tired of crossing picket lines to get to work, in the 1990s, I transitioned over into the semiconductor world, but still under that technical writing umbrella, only doing instructional design work. So I've been a technical editor, a technical writer, an instructional designer, and then in the mid to late 90s, I actually got headhunted by a little software company called Blue Sky Software. And that's how I ended up on the software side of the business. And I was with Blue Sky Software, then eHelp, then Macromedia, and then one of the founders here at Madcap Software. So that's, for those who didn't know, that's who I am, my bit of my background. And for those who know me, yes, that was a bit of a stall tactic. 
because another 38 people managed to get logged in and I think we're pretty much ready to go now. So the official title of this presentation, Madcap Flare Power Features, how to leverage the not so obvious to improve your productivity. And what it really boils down to is we have certain things that we've added over the years that I think are really cool and really powerful, but I'm just not sure we got the word out because there's often, you know, every release has some kind of major feature that marketing wants to focus on. And there's other cool stuff that, you know, just may not get the, uh, the, the bandwidth or the megaphone to shout about. So that's what we're going to focus on today, those kind of hidden gems. Now, before we get started, though, a couple of announcements, because somebody always asks, so I just like to address it up front. Yes, this webinar is being recorded. We always record our webinars. Even if you don't attend live, just by signing up, you will receive an email when this recording goes live. Now, it usually takes, you know, a bit of processing, you know, marketing wants to refine it, add some notes into it. So it will probably go live on the website tomorrow. But when it does, anybody who either attended live or signed up will receive an email with a link to the recording. And then the other big question, you may have noticed that your microphones are on mute. I mean, we have to do that. When you have nearly 400 people sign up for a webinar, the amount of background noise would be crazy. And it also protects your privacy. So you can hear me, but nobody on the call can hear you. But that brings up, well, how do I ask questions then? Well, if you look at the GoToWebinar interface, there is a little bar, a little tab that says questions. And you can actually open that up if you're on dual monitors into a bigger window. And there is a live questions panel. And you can feel free to type questions into that panel at any time. You don't have to wait until the end. I am running dual monitors. Even though I'm presenting full screen on one, I can see those questions as they come in. Now, if I don't jump on your question immediately, don't panic. I will see them when they come in, but I might, you know, pause a few minutes, finish what I'm presenting, and then I may lean over, check my other monitor, and then we'll get to any questions as they come in. All right, so that's kind of the preliminary announcements. Now for the specific items that I plan to cover today. The first one, single sourcing with multimedia. This is something that Madcap Software literally invented, I, I want to say like eight years ago, and we really underestimated it how hard it was to do this. We figured we would do this, you know, the ability to use conditions, the ability to use variables inside of images and movie files. And we thought, this is so cool. We've got like a two-year head start and everybody's going to copy us. Well, it turns out it's a lot harder to do than I thought because the trick is you not only have to have a world-class editor, but you need to have high quality multimedia tools as well, because they have to talk to each other. And I guess a lot of the other systems just don't have the pair. So that's what we're going to start with. Then we're going to look at some advanced snippet use cases. Most of our users are familiar with snippets, but I've met a lot of users that didn't know that you can actually use conditions or variables inside of a snippet. And instead of controlling them at the target level, you can actually control them at the topic level. So I could use the same snippet in three different topics, and I could hide conditional A in topic you know, B, 
I could hide conditional B in topic A, and it's the same snippet file. So we're going to look, look at some advanced use cases for snippet conditions and snippet variables. And this one, I don't know, this is kind of the, the weak sauce of the group. I wanted to throw this in only because I think too many people dismiss this as, you know, a sales gimmick, a marketing gimmick. But this is the one I'm going to go outside of Flair. And I'm going to talk about Madcap Central for a moment. And really, I, I just want to share some kind of real world experiences we've had and some of the unexpected data we've literally pulled out of our own analytics here at the company. Um, customer trends we never expected to see and we would have never known about if we didn't have those analytics. All right, this one, the, in fact, the next two are probably two of my favorites. And again, I wish more people got into the CSS language. There is so much power there. And then Flare has two kind of really advanced use cases. Now, the first one is a CSS variable. Now, this is, I almost wish we had a different name for this. It's not like a text variable. A CSS variable is Madcap software trying to bring the same content management, content reuse principles into the CSS editor that we use in our normal content editor. And one of the key rules in content management, content should only exist once. You know, even something as simple as the phrase, from the file menu, choose save. You know, if that needs to show up in 50 topics, we can write it as a snippet one time and pull it into 50 topics by reference. Well, the problem is then you get into the style sheet editor and all those rules go out the window. If you want your heading one text to be the official company color, you assign the color. And then if you want your heading two text to also be the official company color, you assign the color again. And then if you have a note or a tip style that puts a box around a paragraph and you want the box border to be the official company color, you add it in your style sheet a third time. So the style sheet has always kind of broken the rules that we live by in our main content editor. We're duplicating all of these values. Well, that's where a CSS variable comes in. I can create a CSS variable, company primary color equals Carolina blue. I set that one time. And now in 10 different styles, I could say color equals company primary color. And because I set that to be Carolina blue in one place, whoop, they all update. But now we go through a rebrand, you know, if marketing changes the company look, I don't have to go find all these styles. I literally change one CSS variable. Company primary color equals fire engine red. Whoop, every place I've referenced that style variable, they all just updated. So that's pretty cool. We're going to do that live. You can actually see how I can do that in the Flare Style Sheet Editor. And then the last thing we're going to look at, and again, I think this was kind of a, a secondary feature of one year, and so it just didn't get the press coverage we were hoping. But you can actually apply conditional markers through your style sheet. So you don't have to go manually open the topics, manually apply a conditional marker. If you want to conditionalize every bit of content that already has a particular style applied to it, then you can do that literally in seconds in the style sheet editor. All right, so that's a pretty full bucket. I think we can do it all in one hour. Let's go ahead and jump in to the first one single sourcing inside of multimedia. 
So with that, let me go ahead and get rid of this slide. I'm going to pull up my copy of Flare, but before I even do that, here's my fictional scenario. I want to go ahead and I want to take a screenshot of this area of my desktop, that little green box. That's going to be the area that I take a screenshot of. But here's my fictional problem. For some customers, I need to include all five of those icons. But for other customers, I only want to show four of those icons. Well, traditionally, that would mean you'd have to have two different images. You'd have to put both images in the same topic. You'd have to get really creative. We don't have to do that with the Madcap software tool collection. We can have one image and manage that extra icon using conditionals. All right, so how do we pull this off? Well, let me go ahead and open up a copy of Flare. I'm going to go ahead and press the Enter key. I just want to get some extra space. And I'm going to drop a screenshot in right there, right where my cursor is. So I'll go up to the Insert tab, Insert Screen Capture. And I should point out, to do these fancy techniques, you do need to be using the two multimedia tools that ship with Flare. They, they're free. They come with it. There's nothing extra to purchase, but you have the Madcap Capture Utility for the static images, Madcap Mimic for doing the training videos and the tutorial type videos. I'm going to do a static version. So on the Insert tab, I'm going to say Insert Screen Capture. I then have to give it a name. You know, what file format do I want? And then I'm going to check Capture region. So that's going to give me this little bounding box. I'm going to resize this. Now you have to think about this a little bit. One of the images, I want the orange logo or the orange icon removed. So I'm literally going to move this out of the way before I take my first screenshot. So that's what I want for a basic customer. I'll click the, crap, the Capture Screenshot button. Boom. It was just dropped into my topic. But now here's where I'm going to get a little sneaky. I don't want a second graphic, but I'm going to take a second screen capture. And you'll see why here in a moment. So my cursor is just blinking to the right of that first image. I'll hit Screen Capture again. All the same settings. Capture Region. But this time, I'm going to move that little orange icon back, and I'm going to resize my capture region to just grab that little orange icon. I'll hit that, hit that snapshot button again. So now it's in here twice. Why did I do that? Well, for what we're going to do next, I'm going to right-click on this image now. And from the right click menu, edit with Madcap Capture. So it just opened in that external image tool. Again, it ships for free with Flare. If you don't have it installed, but you have Flare installed, then you just reach out to your IT department. Somebody goofed. They should have installed this when they installed Flare for you. All right, but here's the trick. Why did I do that twice? Well, I'm going to right click on the orange icon and copy. Now I'm going to go, there we go, to the first one that I did. Oh, actually, that's not the first one I did. This is what I get for practicing and rehearsing before we started here. Back to my topic, right click. And I'm going to choose Edit with Capture again. 
all right, that's the one I want right there. And now I'm going to right click and paste. And right about you're saying, but wait a minute, that's the same thing. Actually, it's not. That orange icon is a separate layer than the image behind. Now, why is that important? Well, I'm going to double click on that orange layer. I'm going to go into conditions. And I'm going to tag that as company B only, that blue conditional tag, and click OK. So now you can see that little overlay has that conditional marker. And because these two tools talk to each other, all I have to do is in, in Capture now, I click Save, and it just updated that image in my topic. That's it. That's all I had to do. So now I can delete that secondary image. Again, I just needed it temporarily so I could copy and paste from it. But now I have one image. And when I publish, if I tell Flare, keep anything marked in blue, then you'll see all five icons. If I tell Flare, remove anything marked in blue, then that orange icon will be removed automatically. Now, obviously, that's a silly little screen capture example, but you can leverage that up. You can literally change like software interfaces. I have a sample file here. If I open this, oh, that's not the one I want. There we go. So here you can see it says calculator basic. And there is no scientific keypad. But if we preview this in our web browser, well, now you can see it says Calculator Enterprise. And there is a scientific keypad and an extra arrow, just for giggles. But again, if we go to the original, the scientific keypad is an overlay with a conditional color. The label calculator enterprise is an overlay with the same conditional color, and so is the, red, the orange arrow. So those three overlays can be included, like on the right, or excluded, like you see on the left. But the big advantage, if the engineers ever make an update to the common area, I can literally replace the bottom layer screenshot, and I don't have to rebuild my arrows, my overlays. So again, it's bringing those content management principles even to the media files. Now, we don't have time, because boy, time is slipping away fast, but we can even drop text variables into these images. And very briefly, I can show you an example of that. So in this example, the word company in that heading one is a text variable. So when I publish for Microsoft, it will say Microsoft products. When I publish for Apple, it will say app. Well, that same variable is embedded in a text callout bubble embedded in the pixels. And in this case, it's a JPEG. Somebody was asking, are there other file extensions? Basically, any file extension that Flare supports, if it's a bitmap graphic, we can do this. So we can do PNGs, we can do GIFs, we can do JPEGs. But I'm going to preview this, but I'm going to preview for my partner, XYZ Corporation. Now, when it previews, not only did Flare update that heading one text, but it was able to reach into the pixels of a JPEG and update that text. Now, again, we don't have time to do this in movies, but those same techniques I just demonstrated, you can actually do those in movie files as well. So I could have a variable, customer name, and that could be at the frame, you know, 20 seconds into the video, at the frame 40 seconds into the, 
And whenever I publish that video, I could actually embed my customer's name in those videos, but I only have to record the video once. Um, oh, there's a question. Wouldn't I want to resize an image when I remove a logo? You could, but some customers, their sizing is critical, especially for not doing web publishing, but PDF publishing, and you're working in fixed dimensions of a fixed paper page. So there are multiple ways it could be done. All right, but I spent way too much time on that example. So now we're going to go to our second technique and snippet conditions and snippet variables. These are ones that I absolutely love. So for this example, I'm going to open up a different topic and I'm gonna start with a little silly example, but then we'll move on to a much more kind of real world example. I have this silly little topic called kitchen procedures. Oh, question, could this be used to show the version of a software? Oh, absolutely. You could literally paint out the official version number so it's just a regular background, replace that with a text variable, that uses the same font and size as the rest of the interface. And then you could just continually update that version number for that software using the variable without having to keep retaking that screenshot if you wanted to. All right, but like I said, time is slipping away. We have to go to the next example. So here's my challenge. I have this topic named Kitchen Procedures. And it talks about using the oven, using the freezer, and using the fryer. Well, the company safety officer yelled at me and said, we can't do that. We need to put some kind of safety text in there. Otherwise, we're going to get in trouble if somebody gets injured. So what I did, I didn't want to duplicate anything. So I went into resources. I went into snippets and I created a snippet file, but it just says danger colon never. Now what on the worst hot and cold equipment surfaces and equipment is a variable. What's going on here? Well, I did that intentionally because if we go back to kitchen procedures here, well, Using the oven, you have to avoid hot surfaces, but using the freezer, you have to avoid cold surfaces. And I wanted to show this extreme example because not only could I control it at the topic level, but I could literally control it paragraph by paragraph. So under the oven, I'll press enter. And this is a cool thing a lot of people don't realize about snippets. If you just type the first six characters or so, it will actually recommend a snippet file. It's like, oh, don't type that. That already exists. I press the enter key and it drops in my snippet file. I'll do the same thing under freezer. Press enter. Press enter. It drops in my snippet file. But here's where we get into the local override. And this isn't a condition, this is actually called a snippet condition. On the oven snippet, I'm gonna right click on that snippet block. Don't choose regular, choose snippet conditions. And I'm gonna go in and I'm actually going to choose, we're talking about the oven, we need hot. So I'm gonna select cold and set it to exclude. I want that removed and then click OK. And so now it says never touch hot equipment surfaces. Perfect. But in that very same topic, I go down below the freezer, right click, snippet conditions, and this time I'll say anything marked hot, exclude, and click OK. So now 
I didn't duplicate the snippet. It only exists once, but it can still be tailored for an individual use case. Now, to even kick that up one more notch, what about the word equipment? Well, I could probably leave that the way it is and still get away with it. But if I really want to get fancy, I can right click on that snippet block in the left margin and this time choose snippet variables. And I can change the word equipment. Again, we're talking about the oven up here. So I'll just type oven and then click OK. And then down below, I'll right click on the freezer snippet block, choose snippet variables, and we'll do freezer and click OK. So now never touch hot oven surfaces is under using the oven. Never touch cold freezer surfaces is under the freezer. But again, I only have a single snippet file that I'm trying to manage. So a couple of questions have come in. When would you set the condition at the snippet level versus the target level? Well, if you set it at the target level, it's a global. That means everywhere this snippet was used, it would either be hot or cold. It would be one or the other. By using a local override, then I can choose on an individual use case. So if I did it at the target level, these would both say hot or they would both say cold. By doing it as a local override, I get more control. Oh, you caught me. Somebody said, your three instructions are identical. Shouldn't those be a snippet then as well? You are correct, they should. I didn't even realize I did that. I really didn't care about the three steps. I was focusing more on the snippet file, but that was a good observation. That would be a good snippet candidate as well. All right, so that was a silly example. Now this is a simplified real world example. I don't have permission to use their name, so I'll generify a little bit. But one of our customers uses Flare. They're a major auto manufacturer. And one of the challenges their team was facing is they have all of these topics that have tables in them. And in fact, let me pull up a sample here. So they will have a topic that lists a column of part numbers, a column that is the name of each part, and then like this column that says procedure, and it will link to, you know, installation procedures or something like that, but that's in one topic. Then in a different topic, there will be another table, same part numbers, same part names, but this table includes links to order replacement parts. And then similarly, there might be a third topic somewhere where there are links to the CAD drawings or something. And the way their content is structured, they had to do this. The problem was it's a nightmare to maintain because if the engineers add a new part number or delete a part number, well, then they were stuck scanning through their entire Flare project and manually updating just dozens of these related tables. Well, that is when somebody on their team got smart. They literally went in and deleted all of these tables. And instead, they created the monster table, but the monster table is created as a snippet file. If you look at the file extensions, FLSNP, Flare Snippet. But in this monster table, they've used conditional color codes on each of the columns. So now if we go back to the procedure topic, 
they inserted the table snippet, but they turned off orange and green columns for the procedures topic. Then they went into the replacement parts topic, linked the same snippet, but they turned off the green and the red. And then they went to data and they turned off the red and the orange. So each topic has the tabular data they need, but if they ever have to add a part or delete a part now, they go to the snippet, delete a line or add a new line, and that auto updates all of those smaller kind of sub tables because now they're all being rendered from this one primary snippet. So that was a pretty cool use case. All right, so, oh man, time is slipping away. So that was snippet conditions and snippet variables. And again, I'm, I'm really not trying to do so much training here as just dropping some seeds. Now that you know these are available, you can look up kind of the minutia of the details in the Flare documentation. All right, now analytics. We're gonna do this one very quickly because this is gonna be more just surprising kind of lessons learned. So if I pull up my web browser, I am currently logged into my central account, Madcap Central being our cloud backbone that supports Flare authoring. And one of the functions in Central is this analytics tab. And yes, you can do topic hits and how many views particular topics have received. But the one report, well, actually there are two reports that have really kind of been of a shock benefit above and beyond what we expected. And the first one was phrases with no results. Now that's in the search category. And what that means is, okay, what did our customers search for? And the system couldn't find anything. So they literally got zero results from their search query. Now, a lot of people think that is going to show where you're missing content, where you need to write a new topic. And yes, that can happen on occasion, but usually it just shows where you're using a different vocabulary than your customer. I mean, if you've been very careful and you've used the word images very consistently, but then your customer searches on the word graphics, or no results. But now that you know that's happening, you can go in, create a Flare synonym file, graphics equal images, and now the customer searches on their vocabulary, they find content with your vocabulary, and everybody's happy. The thing that was surprising for us, and I guess we could have seen this coming, we should have, but we didn't think about it, the first couple of months that we ran these phrases with no results reports, it was amazing how many of our customers were searching in the Flare documentation, but using our competitors vocabulary. Uh, for example, we had people coming from RoboHelp that didn't know what a Flare target file was. Instead, they were searching for single source layout. Well, that's kind of what the RoboHelp equivalent to a target file is. So that was an eye opener. It's like, oh my gosh, single source layout equals target. Boom. Now the customer can search what they're looking for and find our content. And again, things like image, you know, graphic, that you kind of think, yeah, I can do that. But being able to kind of see your customer do searches and then some of the crazy things they're searching for, that was just kind of an, uh, a surprise benefit to me. And then the other one that I really thought was just kind of a parlor trick is down here where it says demographics, browser statistics, and operating system statistics. Again, it's cool. Yeah, it's nice to know. But what surprised me is now the 
technical writing team almost became the the heroes because R and D, the engineers, the programmers, they weren't sure if they could do something really on the cutting edge of CSS. It's like, hey, do we really have enough customers that are, you know, on a modern enough web browser? And that's where we were able to step in from the tech writing team and say, well, look, we've got all the data. If you're worried about dropping, you know, some seven-year-old version of Firefox, well, we can tell you right now, nobody has looked at the Flare documentation using that particular version of Firefox in the last three years. Yeah, you're, you're pretty safe to drop support for that old, old model. So as much as I thought things like browser statistics and operating system statistics were just kind of a parlor trick, well, it turns out, as long as we're willing to share that data with the engineers, it turned out to be massively helpful. All right, so that was just two lessons learned with analytics. All right, now the last two, and we're down to 20 minutes. I think we're in pretty good shape. So a CSS variable. Again, I kind of set the stage for that. It's not like a text variable. It's not like we saw in those images or in the snippets. This is more a variable for the kind of the look and feel for parts of your style sheet. And even people who know this exists, they struggle a little bit with implementations. That's really my goal here is to kind of show you if you want to do this, what is the technique to implement this? All right, so I'm going to bring Flare back up. I'm going to close some of these files we've already looked at just to tidy things up a little bit. But I'm going to jump into my long topic here. And right now, my heading one is blue. My heading two is black. And apparently, marketing wants all of the headings to be consistent but they want them all to be a green color because apparently the official company color is green. So if I have to make these adjustments anyways, let's do a best practice. So I'm going to open the style sheet for this particular Flare project. And the first thing you do have to do, if you're in view, simplified, then you are going to have to switch to view advanced. That is one hurdle. CSS variables do not work in the simplified editor. Once you're in view advanced, then up here on the upper toolbar where it says CSS variable, I drop that down and I select add new. CSS variable. Now there's this little dialog. As far as element, leave that at root. Name. Don't name this for the color. You know, don't name this super blue. Don't name that, you know, corporate red. Keep it generic because again, this might change over time. So I'm going to name this corp prime color so just shorthand for corporate primary color what is this the what is the main branding color that our company uses now property type you don't have to do colors this could be a font family this could be a specific image like a a company logo or something but i am going to go with color and then for a specific color, now a lot of people just go to the drop down and they get mad. They're like, wait a minute, I have to match an exact company color. That's not going to work. Well, not to worry. If you have like an RGB value or a hexadecimal value, then click on the little paint bucket. Here I can actually manually type in a hexadecimal or an RGB value. 
or this is all maybe I wanted you know this shade of purple I can just select it manually or if you really want to get fancy bring up an existing web page that has the product color the company colors on it click that little eyedropper and then you can go click on the official company color on the web page and flare will steal that exact color so that makes it super easy now i'm just going to go with this obnoxious purple that's easy for us to see i click ok i'm done with step one we have now created a css variable I'm going to do a save all. All right, now I want to use that variable. How do we use it? Well, in my list of selectors on the left, marketing wants all the heading ones to be and heading twos to be consistent. So I'm going to scroll down, select H1, my selector. I'll go to font group. Right now the color is blue. I'm going to delete. That value in its place with my cursor blinking right there don't click the little navigate button on the right that's where most people go awry since CSS variables are kind of outside the normal kind of CSS technology it's something that madcap added I put my cursor there and I actually go back up to the toolbar where it says CSS variable but when I drop down, instead of add new, I choose insert CSS variable. I can grab corporate primary color, click OK. It was just dropped into that color field. Why didn't it update? Did Mike do something wrong here? Oh well, we'll push ahead. We'll try H2. We'll get rid of the black. Insert CSS variable. Primary color. So if everything worked, All right, Mike, what did you do? Let's go back. Let's go to variables. We're going to go to root. Go down to variables. Oh! Dopey me. I did it under medium print, not under medium default. Well, that's cool. Because now if I go back to long topic, well, now heading one and heading two, they're consistent on the website. But if I switch to print layout, well, heading two was purple, but apparently somebody put some local formatting on this one. Anyways, that was my goof up, but that should be easy enough to fix. We'll come over here to the right side. Set our value. And let's see if that did it. There we go. So now it's behaving the way I expected. Question, could you add these in the text editor instead of the style sheet editor? I'm pretty sure you could. If we go into style sheets, right click, open with text editor. Do, 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 do. Yep, color. You would just have to recognize that specific syntax but yes those could those values could be added right here at the text level 
but again, it's, it's one of those techniques. It's not going to save you a ton of time when you initially create your style sheet. But then, you know, a year from now, 18 months from now, when somebody in marketing says, yeah, everything that was purple, it now needs to be bright red. Well, instead of trying to locate 30 places in the style sheet where I need to do that, I just go back to the style sheet. Up at the top, I go to variables and root. I come down to my variables group. And we just change that one time to bright red. Do a save. And now anywhere I've used that purple color, it just updated to red. And that could be boxes around notes and tips. It could be underlines and other stuff. It could have been used in 50 different style locations. All right, and I think we're down to about nine minutes left. So that was variables in a style sheet. One more style sheet related technique and that is applying conditions through your styles and trust me this can be a lifesaver i did a contract where we were doing some some contract work with one of our customers and we were doing training manuals and they want us to publish two different versions of the training manuals and one of them was a student guide. One of them was an instructor guide. That's easy enough. So anywhere there were like dedicated instructor notes, we made sure to use conditional markers on those. But there were other non-instructor notes as well. There was a style just P dot note, and that showed up in hundreds of places. And it wasn't until like two days before the final publish that the customer came back and said, oh, by the way, not only do we want the instructor notes removed from the student manual, but we want the generic notes removed as well. Oh my gosh, why didn't you tell us that months ago? We could have been conditionalizing all of, the, well, the good news, all of those notes had a style on them, you know, P dot note. So what we were able to do is go right into Blair. And so like, here's an example, note some information, note some more information. So if I hover, there is a class named a note on those two paragraphs. But if I need those conditionalized now, and maybe that style has been used in 50 other topics, we just go into our style sheet editor. I'll scroll down to the P, the paragraph group, locate the style A note. And yes, I put the A in front of it just so it would be alphabetized at the top of the list. I'm sneaky that way. So with p.a note selected i'm going to come down here to unclassified that's where we dump in kind of places where madcap has extended the css language and then what we're looking for is the property mc conditions now if i check that little nav box on the right I can say, okay, anything with p.a note, we want to tag that information as confidential. Click OK. Click Save. Now, if I go back to that topic we were just looking at, we'll check that out. You can see that red conditional marker on both of those paragraphs. And again, if that style had been used in 600 topics anywhere that style had been used, boom, they would be automatically conditionalized now. All right, so I realized that was a little bit scattered, but again, the whole 
goal of this webinar was just to focus on some of the lesser known but powerful capabilities in Flare, drop a few seeds, get people kind of thinking outside of their comfort zone. So I am going to open up for any additional questions here in a moment. But before I do that, marketing has asked me to make an announcement. And that's just to remind everybody that it's looking good. We're really going to try and run Mad World again this year. It's going to be in the middle of June. Instead of being in San Diego, it's going to be in Austin, Texas this time. We had feedback, especially for East Coasters, getting all the way to San Diego was just a bit too far. So we've tried to centralize it. And I don't have it on the slide here, but if you hop up to our website, there are going to be live in-person options if you want to come to Austin. But there's also a Mad World at Home option if you want to participate virtually from the comfort of your desk chair. So that if, if that's interesting, I recommend hopping up to our website. There's more details up there. For those who can come or are comfortable coming live, you know, Mad World is getting kind of a reputation in the industry as being the go-to event. It, it's seriously getting to a point where we have other companies coming to us asking if we can mentor them on how to throw a successful conference. Um, you know, not our direct competitors, but just ancillary other companies. All right, but with that, I am going to go ahead and open up to questions. I think I've hit most of the questions that were already asked. I'm going to scroll back up and read back through those again. Oh, I missed that. There was a question. Could a snippet be used in conjunction with a div? Absolutely. There is no limitation on combining elements like that. That would work just fine. Okay, there was a question not even related to the content here. Do you know when single sign-on will be available for Madcap Central? Oh my gosh, what can I say here? I'm not supposed to talk about things that haven't been released yet. Um, a little peek behind the scenes. That's a tougher nut to crack than we thought. We thought initially it would be easy enough that we could just add an interface with like three radio buttons. Hey, which of these three techniques do you want to use? Then we put it in front of customers and they all hated it. And what we found out was there's like 50 different ways that different companies are doing single sign-on. So that has caused us to rethink. This is not a promise. This is not a guarantee. But rather than having a slick interface of, hey, choose the radio button, it might be rewritten just as an API plugin that your developers would have to you know, script into just to accommodate all these different SSO techniques that are out there. I know that's not nearly as convenient. And again, I'm not promising that that's going to happen. It's just based on what we've already done, what we've already shown to customers and the feedback we're getting, that's becoming kind of a likely direction. So probably not the answer you wanted, but that's kind of where we're at right now. Oh, good comment from Leslie. There's also an easy way to switch to those CSS variables. You could use the Madcaps find and replace tool, but it said it to find and replace in source code only affects CSS files. And then you could 
search all of the existing hexadecimal values and replace it with that variable syntax that I showed. You're absolutely right, Leslie. That's a quick way to do it for those who are comfortable kind of pushing that find and replace into the more advanced modes. Okay, question. I realize we're right on the hour. If people need to drop off, we will officially call this the close. While I was going back, about three more questions popped in. I want to get to those three questions, and then we'll have an unofficial close. But the webinar is officially closed at this time. All right, but there was a question about the analytics. Will there ever be a way to distinguish between external viewers, i.e. customers, and internal viewers, colleagues and coworkers. That might be possible, but my gut feeling is probably no. Only because we have to be very careful that analytics are pure data and do not do any actual tracking. Otherwise, that would violate a lot of the privacy laws, especially in the European Union. They're really strict over there. So as of right now, our analytics are just pure raw data. Now, if you need to track to a more detailed level, then go ahead and look at some of the new Flare LMS integration technology because once you integrate Flare with an LMS system, then you can be sneaky. You could add a single test question at the bottom of a page that doesn't look like a test, just something as, hey, did this topic help you? And regardless of how they answer, boom, it just logged their individual name that, hey, they were on this page in the learning management system. So there are ways but it's outside of just general web analytics. We literally have to get into the LMS integration at that point to satisfy those privacy laws. All right, and then there was a question, could we change the colors of arrows in one of those capture images I showed at the very beginning using those CSS variables. Unfortunately, we couldn't at this time. What you could do, though, is include a green arrow, include a red arrow, put them both in that image, and then apply a conditional marker to them. And then when you publish, you could just tell Flare hey, hide the green arrow, include the red arrow, or vice versa. All right, so I think that was the last question. We're going to officially call this finished. Thank you so much, everybody, for participating. Again, anybody who was here, you should be getting a link to the webinar probably tomorrow-ish, not today. But with that, thank you so much. Have a great rest of today and an even better rest of your week. Cheers, everybody.